Let me give you three examples. Let's eat grandma. Or let's eat grandma. The pause is significant. How about this one? Crocodiles don't swim here. Or crocodiles don't swim here. That pause could be real important for your life. Well, I think this pause in worship is really important for us. In fact, we're going to begin worship today with a great way to pause. We're going to watch a, Baptist, a baptism. Colossians. <laughs> Colossians 2.12 says this. Having been buried with him in baptism, in, in which you were also raised with him through your faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. We're gonna watch a burial, a baptism, but we're gonna watch a resurrection here. This is Alan Hurst. He is uh, the brother to Beth Myrick, and Debbie Raines. Uh, Alan's been on our prayer list for a while. He's been battling some issues with his health and he's got more surgery coming up next week. But uh, through this process, he's had time to think and reflect and. And he's decided he's ready to make this decision to surrender his life fully and completely to Jesus as Savior and Lord in the waters of baptism. So, Alan, I'm going to ask you to repeat your confession of faith. I believe, I believe that Jesus is the Christ, that Jesus is the, Christ. the Son of the living God, the Son of the living God. And, my personal Lord and Savior. and my personal Lord and Savior. God bless you for that confession, brother. Because of that confession of faith, Alan, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, that your sins may be washed away, that you may be filled with the Spirit and added to His church. What a better way to begin than, than that for worship today. Thank you for this pause we have. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. You can stand up, please.
Let us pray. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for allowing us to be here with you this morning to worship you. We got to witness an amazing baptism first thing this morning. What a better way to start our day. Lord, I ask that you be with those who are unable to be with us this morning. Give them strength and hope in knowing that you are there for them always. We ask this in your son's name, Jesus. Amen. If you like, you can be seated.
together. Father in heaven, as we have lifted up songs of worship to you this morning, we have been reminded of what an awesome, awesome, loving, loving God you are. And Father, it is our privilege to be in your presence this morning. And Lord, I pray that you'll help us realize today that we are not here by accident, but this is a divine appointment that you've set apart for us to be in your presence so that you could speak to our hearts through your word. And Father, I pray that for each one here, we will open our hearts and and listen to what you might be trying to say to us individually this morning that can draw us closer to Jesus, that can help us change our lives in a way that will help us be more who you created us to be. Father, I thank you for those in this room who attend faithfully week after week, month after month, and they've been doing that for years. I thank you for those, Father, who've just been worshiping with us recently and have come back 
And I thank you, Lord, for those in this room this morning for the first time. And their willingness to come and, and give worship at UCC a try, Lord. And I pray that for all of us, we can sense your presence here. We will yield to your spirit as you speak to us through your word. Father, we've come in with trials and challenges. All of us have stuff going on in our lives. And we pray, Lord, that as we leave here today, we will leave with a renewed strength and a renewed hope to face those challenges, not alone, but with you at our side. And we pray all this in the wonderful name of Jesus our Lord. Amen. You may be seated. I'm going to start this morning by asking you kind of a heavy question. In the grand scheme of things, does your life really matter that much? Now, I know we'd all like to think that our lives matter. That somehow, some way, we are going to make a difference and we're going to leave our mark on this world. But is that really the case? And if you do want that to be the case, then what are you doing to make sure your life leaves a mark on this world? You know, when you think about it, there are some people who will do some crazy things to leave their mark on history, right? For example, several years ago, a group of people got together in La Canada, uh, Flint Ridge Community Center in California, and they decided they were going to make their mark on the world by building and making the world's biggest Rice Krispie Street. That's right. Now, I, I've got a Rice Krispie Street here this morning. These things are good, aren't they? I, I like Rice Krispies treats, but, but they wanted something a little bigger than this. Well, guess what? I've got something a little bigger than this this morning. Now that's, that's a big Rice Krispies tree right there, isn't it? Love you too, Charlie. But you're not getting it. This is a big Rice Krispie Street, but theirs was just a little bit bigger. Theirs weighed 10,400 pounds. Kellogg's donated 5,000 pounds of Rice Krispies and 7,000 pounds of marshmallows were used. The marshmallows they put at the top weighed about three pounds each. That's the marshmallows, about three pounds each. Now, I found a video on YouTube of the unveiling of this giant Rice Krispie treat. I'm going to show it to you in a minute, hopefully. If we can get it queued up back here. But before I do that, I know that today's a special day for a few people. For instance, uh, is Bud Evans here today? I didn't see them come in. Okay, it's Bud's birthday. So he didn't get one because he's not here. But uh, I know it's Mike and Kelly Green's anniversary today. So, um, Nolan, will you be my runner? Okay. Run these back to, to Mike for he and Kelly for their anniversary. 41 years, Mike? 41 years. I actually got to do their wedding ceremony back four decades ago. And also, there's another Mike and Kelly. Michael and Kelly McDonough have their wedding anniversary today. And so, Nolan, if you'll take that over to Kelly to give for her and Michael right over here about the third row. All right. Uh, anybody else with an anniversary today? Anybody else with a birthday today? Okay, well, there is one person who, oh, well, first, Trish, come on up. It's not Trish's birthday, but Trish has been with us for 17 years. She's been in our sound booth almost that long. Uh, she's a wonderful servant of the Lord. She has been involved in our women's ministries, our education ministries, discipleship ministries. She's been a, a wonderful blessing. And this is her last Sunday with us, dog on it. Uh, she's going to be moving to Wyoming. So, uh, Rice Krispie Treat is our going away I love you present. Okay, Thank Trish? You. But, there's one person here this morning that had a rebirth day today. And that's Alan. And so, Nolan, if you can run this over to, to Alan for his rebirth day. All right, now we're going to show you this video, but as you watch this, um, I just want you to pay attention.
to how much excitement this project created. Watch the crowd. Okay, let's watch. It keeps going on, but it's just more yelling and cheering, okay? And honestly, I, I don't know what surprises me more. How big that Rice Krispies treat is or how much excitement it generated. Think about that. Now, I, I watched another video of this, and it showed the guy at the end holding the certificate showing that it was a Guinness World Record. And he said something like, this is the greatest thing that ever happened to me. Really? It's a Rice Krispies treat. Come on. I mean, I wouldn't want that thing in my backyard, would you? It would just attract critters. You'd never be able to eat it all right. And what you didn't eat would go to rot. And what you were able to eat would make your teeth rot. And that'd be about the end of it, right? But it's, you know, I, I'm sure that it brought the community together. I think it was part of some kind of a fundraising campaign. So, so all that's great. But my point is, it's unbelievable. It's pretty bizarre what some people will do trying to get other people's attention or trying to show that they're special in some way. But many of those things we do, they aren't really going to make any kind of a lasting impact, are they? They're not going to change the world. They, they might uh, get us some attention. They might change people's opinion of us. They might make us feel good for a while. But that's about as far as it's going to go. In the end, in the long run, it's meaningless. Or as Solomon put it in the book of Ecclesiastes, it's like chasing after the wind. I want my life to have meaning. I want my life to count for something in the long run. Don't you? That's what I want. When I stand before God someday, and he says, Steve, what did you do? With all the abilities, all the opportunities, all the resources I provided you with in your lifetime. What would you do with all that? I want to be able to say something more than, well, God, I made this giant Rice Krispies treat. Want to see my Guinness World Record? You know, somehow I don't think he's going to be too impressed with that. I think deep down inside, all of us want more than that for our lives, don't we? And I know God wants more than that from us. God filled us with his Holy Spirit for a greater purpose than that. He filled us with his Spirit because he wants us to be his ambassadors. He wants us to be light in a dark world. He wants us to go and make disciples, baptizing them and teaching them to obey and to follow Jesus. In short, God says to each one of us, I want to use you to change the world. I think many of us have been fooled into believing that we need to impress other people. And we try so hard to impress other people, but I can't find a verse anywhere in the Bible that tells us we need to impress somebody else. What I can find are verses that tell us to love other people and to serve other people, to forgive other people, to consider other people better than ourselves. So the challenge of this new series that we begin this morning is for us to stop trying to impress others and instead go all in on learning how to let God use us to impact others. 
so that one friend, one neighbor, one person at a time, we can change our world. And let's face it, our world needs some changing, amen? I mean, our world is a mess, maybe a bigger mess than it's been in our lifetime. But it's not a hopeless mess. So for the next several weeks, we're going to be looking at the life of Joseph in the Old Testament to help us discover how we can live with a holiness and a passion and a commitment that God can use to help us change our world for him. And we'll learn that the things we do, they may not be all that impressive, impressive to other people. But when we stand before God someday and we tell him what we did with our lives, God will be able to nod approvingly and say, well done, good and faithful servant. You were all in to change your world. In our text for this morning, we'll see that when Joseph was young, he was naive, he was arrogant, he didn't seem to get it when it came to how God wanted to use him to change the world. Joseph had some growing up to do first. And maybe we do too. Maybe there are some areas where we need to mature as followers of Jesus before we really get it and can finally see how God can use our lives when we go all in to change our world. So this morning's text is found in Genesis 37. And starting with verse 1, we read that Jacob lived in the land where his fathers had stayed, the land of Canaan. This is the account of Jacob's family line. Joseph, a young man of 17, was tending the flocks with his brothers, the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives. And he brought their father a bad report about them. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any of his other sons because he had been born to him in his old age. And he made an ornate robe for him. When his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of them, they hated him and could not speak a kind word to him. Joseph had a dream. And when he told it to his brothers, they hated him all the more. He said to them, listen to this dream I had. We were binding sheaves of grain out in the field when suddenly my sheaf rose and stood upright while your sheaves gathered around mine and bound down to it. His brothers said to him, do you intend to reign over us? Will you actually rule us? And they hated him all the more because of his dream and what he had said. Then he had another dream, and he told it to his brothers. Listen, he said, I had another dream, and this time the sun and moon and eleven stars were bowing down to me. When he told his father as well as his brothers, his father rebuked him and said, what is this dream you had? Well, your mother and I and your brothers actually come and bow down to the ground before you? His brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the matter in mind. So, Joseph is having these visions as God begins to reveal his plan for Joseph's life. God wanted this 17-year-old to know he was destined for great things. But these verses also show us that Joseph had some glaring weaknesses. He had a big ego he needed to overcome before God could use him. After having these visions, instead of seeking after God's plan, what next, God? Instead of doing that, Joseph seemed more interested in trying to impress his brothers. So he appeared where he wasn't wanted. And he said what nobody wanted to hear. And he flaunted what nobody else had, whether it was favors from daddy or whether it was visions from God. He may have been trying to impress his brothers, but all he really accomplished is instead he enraged his brothers. So the first step in growing up, Joseph needed to learn before he could change his world, is he needed to seek God's plan. And if we want to change our world today, then like Joseph, we all must grow up enough to seek God's plan rather than seeking the praise of men. Verse 2 tells us, that Joseph was tending the flocks with his brothers, the sons of Bilhah, the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives, and he brought their father a bad report about them. Now, I don't want to get sidetracked here, 
But the first thing that may have jumped out of you as I read that verse is the fact that Joseph's father had more than one wife. Okay? And uh, I don't want us to get out in the weeds here, but let me just say that it wasn't God's design for men to have more than one wife. And it, it tended to create a lot of problems when they did that. Just as it created a problem in the story we're going to look at here today. But it was very common at that point in Jewish history. But what I really wanted us to see in this verse is that part where it says that Joseph brought their father a bad report about his brothers. In other words, Joseph was a tattletale. Right? He was a tattletale. And he was the son of Jacob's favorite wife, Rachel. And he was also born in his old age, so he was the favorite. And yet Joseph, even though he was the favorite, he still somehow thinks in order to make himself look better, he's got to make his brothers look worse. So he brings a bad report about them to his father. And the words bad report here, literally it means slander, defamation, malicious talk. So even though we don't know for sure what this bad report was, we do know that it was unkind, it was unfair, and it was undermining. But not only was Joseph a tattletale, he was also, as I said, he was a daddy's boy. Okay? Verse 3 tells us, now Israel, and Israel was another name for Jacob, Joseph's father. It was called Jacob earlier. And God changed Jacob's name to Israel in Genesis 35. So both names are used here interchangeably. And it says, now Israel or Jacob loved Joseph more than any of his other sons because he had been born to him in his old age and he made a richly ornamented robe for him. So because he was daddy's favorite, Joseph gets this fancy robe he can wear. So he walks around, he's flaunting it as he wears this robe, showing all his brothers, dad loves me more than you, na 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 na. And then verse 4 tells us, when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of them, they hated him and could not speak a kind word to him. <laughs> what a messed up family. I mean, really. And through all this, we don't see anywhere at all that Joseph is seeking God's plan for his life. He's too busy rubbing it into the face of his brothers that he's the golden child. And they hate him for it. But then, Joseph just adds insult to injury. Because in verses 5 through 9, that's when he brags to them about these dreams that he had. In the first dream, they were all binding up sheaves of grain out in the field. When his sheaf stood straight up, and all his brother's sheaves of grain bowed down to his. And then in the second dream, the sun and the moon and eleven stars all bowed down to Joseph. And his family immediately picked up on the implication that it would mean that not only Joseph's brothers, but also his mother and father would one day bow down to him. And twice these verses tell us that the outcome of Joseph's bragging about these dreams, the outcome was that his brothers hated him all the more. They were jealous of him. They were bitter toward him. They were rude to him. In fact, the Hebrew word for hate appears more in this chapter and in this relationship between Joseph and his brothers. It occurs more here than anywhere else in the Bible. And what's interesting is that all this animosity it seemed to stem from the fact that Joseph was seeking to be admired by his brothers. But he wasn't seeking God's will. He didn't understand. He didn't realize that God didn't give him those dreams so that he could stand above his brothers and, and be the big shot that they all would admire. That's not why God gave him those dreams. God gave him those dreams so that Joseph could one day save the Jews and the Egyptians and several other nations from a terrible drought that was to come. But Joseph was too mature to get it. So he didn't pray for understanding. He didn't reassure his brothers. He didn't try to uphold family unity. He didn't show one ounce of humility. That means Joseph 
wouldn't be ready to fulfill the mission God had for him until he grew up to the point where he would recognize the need for him to first and foremost seek God's plan. And that principle holds true for all of us. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. God has a plan for your life. He has a plan for my life. He has a plan for each of our lives. But how many of us can honestly say that we are seeking God's plan? Instead of just making our own plans. And then we're asking God to bless our plans and make our plans succeed. When I was a teenager, about the same age Joseph was in this story, I had my plans all figured out. I was going to go to Ball State and become an architect. And then I was going to marry the girl I was dating at the time. And I had that all figured out. So I took three years of architectural drawing in high school. I took all the math classes. I took all the classes that would prepare me to go to Ball State, become an architect. And I spent as much time with my girlfriend as I could, thinking that we were going to get married one day. But then, it wasn't until the second semester of my senior year of high school that I realized that what I had planned may not be what God had planned for me. In Matthew 6, Jesus says, But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. And I finally realized that I was kind of making my own little kingdom. And I was trying to, to fit God into my kingdom and get his approval of the little world I was making for myself. And that's when I grew up a little bit. And I decided that I was going to start seeking first the kingdom of God. And I began to ask God to reveal his plan for my life. And in a very short time, he began directing me. He began leading me in a totally different direction. He showed me that as much as I loved my girlfriend, she was not to be a part of the future he had planned for me. So we broke up. Soon after that, we had a youth night at our church, and I was asked to preach. And as I prepared and delivered my first sermon, it reignited a passion I had within me when I was just a little boy. A passion to preach. This is no joke. When I was four or five years old, I used to stand behind our dirty clothes hamper and prepare, pretend it was a pulpit. And I would preach to my dog and my G.I. Joe. I think I baptized my G.I. Joe. Uh, my dog wasn't so easy to convert. <laughs> but I had dreams of, of one day going to Bible college like my big brother Dave and my big brother Mark who went to Bible college. But then a few years later, I got interested in sports. And my dreams of going into the ministry kind of faded as I started dreaming of being a professional athlete. Then I got into my teen years and reality hit me. I realized I wasn't going to play in the major leagues. I wasn't going to be in the NFL. And that's when I started this new dream of, okay, I'm going to go into this field where I can make a good living as an architect. And I'm going to date this girl and one day marry her. And that became my dream. I was making my plans. But it wasn't until after I preached on that youth night that I realized God had another plan for me. And I needed to start seeking God's plan. And after that youth night, let me tell you, I was so excited. I felt so much peace inside. Because for the first time since I was four or five years old, God and I both had the same plan for my life. And it was a wonderful feeling. And that didn't happen because God decided to bless my plans. No, it happened because I grew up enough to seek God's plan and to seek His plan for my life and to trust that plan. I went to Millican College as a Bible major. And when I was there, that's when I met Pam. And a month after I graduated, Pam and I got married. And 
I've been in full-time ministry ever since. And I've been married to the most wonderful wife in the world ever since. And it's just amazing to me how following God's plan has blessed my life. And he has shown me that if I just am faithful to him, then he can use me. And that's all I'm trying to do right now. I'm just trying to let God use me. I'm trying to follow his plan and let him use me to somehow, some way, change this world one heart, one person, one soul at a time. What about you this morning? Are you living to gain people's admiration? Or are you living to change people's eternal destination? Which one is more important to you? Which one are you really living for? To gain people's admiration or to change their eternal destination? Let me ask you this. Be honest. What upsets you more? Knowing that someone doesn't like you or knowing that someone doesn't follow Jesus? Which one bothers you more? When it comes to your job, your friends, the way you spend your time and your money. Do you make those plans based on whatever you think is going to work out best for you? And then you ask God to bless your plans? Or do you seek to know God's plan for your life first? Then make all those other decisions based around what's going to help you accomplish His plan for your life. Proverbs 19.21 says, Many are the plans in a man's heart, but it's the Lord's purpose that prevails. So if your life has been driven by this desire to get God's approval for your plans, then you need to grow up this morning. It's time to grow up and, and start seeking God's plan for your life. It, it might mean making some changes in your life. Maybe not. Maybe you won't have to change much at all. It might be something that, that takes a little bit of time for it to reveal and for you to see what God's plan is. It may not take any time at all. It might come to you quite instantly. But one thing's for sure. Once you are in the center of God's will, you will feel more peace. You'll feel more in tune with the Lord than you have ever felt before. And you'll be in the perfect position for God to use you to change this world. Joseph didn't recognize God's plan for his life. Even after having those dreams, he needed to grow up. And God allowed Joseph to go through some unbelievable difficulties in order to humble Joseph's pride and develop his character to the point where he would grow up and he would mature enough to recognize and carry out God's plan for his life. So the second truth we need to see this morning is that we'll be ready to change our world once we learn to grow through life's pain. Learn to grow through life's pain. As Joseph's story continues, we're told that his father had sent all his brothers out to graze the flocks near Shechem. While daddy's golden child, he didn't have to go. He got to stay at home. But Jacob did end up sending Joseph out just to check on his brothers, make sure they were okay. So Joseph went out to find them, and that's where the story picks up in verse 18. But they, Joseph's brothers, saw him in the distance. And before he reached them, they plotted to kill him. Here comes that dreamer, they said to each other. Come now, let's kill him and throw him into one of these cisterns and say that a ferocious animal devoured him. Then we'll see what comes of his dreams. When Reuben heard this, his oldest brother, he tried to rescue him from their hands. Let's not take his life, he said. Don't shed any blood. Throw him into this cistern here in the desert, but don't lay a hand on him. Reuben said this to rescue him from them and take him back to his father. So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the richly ornamented robe he was wearing. And they took him and threw him into the cistern. Now the cistern was empty. There was no water in it. As they sat down to eat their meal, they looked up and saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead. Their camels were loaded with spices, balm, and myrrh. And they were on their way to take them to Egypt. Judah said to his brothers, What will we gain if we kill our brother and cover up his blood? Come, let's sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay our hands on him. After all, he is our brother, our own flesh and blood. His brothers agreed. 
So when the Midianite merchants came by, his brothers pulled Joseph up out of the cistern and sold him for 20 shekels of silver to the Ishmaelites, who took him to Egypt. Joseph's brothers acted out of jealousy and hate and spite. This was not just some kind of foolish prank. What they did was vicious. It was wicked. It was reprehensible. And all of a sudden, Joseph went from being pampered to being a prisoner, a slave in a foreign land. And his dreams of his brothers one day bowing down to him, that must have seemed like a, a cruel joke to Joseph at this point. Have you ever experienced great pain in your life due to the cruelty of another person? Maybe you were abused as a child. Maybe you were violated as an adult. I can't imagine the pain that that puts you through. Or maybe you lost a job because you were falsely accused of something. Maybe you trusted a friend and they betrayed you and it broke your heart. I know of one minister's wife. We'll call her Jessica. And Jessica tried to help a troubled lady in their church. But the lady became more and more demanding of Jessica's time. And she was very jealous if Jessica spent time with anybody else except her. So when Jessica tried to very lovingly set some boundaries on the relationship, this woman snapped. And while appearing to be friendly on the surface, behind the scenes, she was working to destroy Jessica's reputation and her husband's ministry. She spread slanderous gossip. She ruined relationships. She did immense damage to the Lord's church, and especially to Jessica and her husband. It was a very painful, very trying time in their lives. But they can now look back on that experience, and they can see how God used that nightmare in ways that they couldn't see or even imagine as they were going through it. Now they could see how it drew them closer to each other. It helped them see who their real friends were. It made them both really lean on God. It, it drew them both closer to Him. And it led them to another ministry where they were loved and where they were appreciated for years to come. And while the church where that all happened still struggles to this day, this couple has continued to thrive in their ministry ever since. And that's what God would do with Joseph as well. As we'll see in the weeks to come, God used Joseph's painful experiences to grow him, to prepare him, to ultimately position him as the second in command over all of Egypt so that Joseph could finally carry out God's ultimate plan for his life, which would save thousands of other lives. So again, what about you this morning? What painful experiences are you going through right now? What burdens, what heartaches did you carry in here with you this morning? Maybe you're feeling a little bit like Tattoo the Basset Hound. A Tahoma, Washington newspaper carried the story of Tattoo some years ago. The poor little dog didn't intend to go for an evening run until his owner shut the leash in the car door with Tattoo still outside. And then he took off driving. Motorcycle officer Terry Filbert saw the car pass with something dragging behind it. He said the poor Basset Hound was, quote, picking them up and putting them down as fast as he could. He, the officer chased the car to a stop and Tattoo was rescued. But not before the dog had reached a top speed of 25 miles per hour, falling down and rolling over several times. And maybe that's how you feel this morning. You're picking them up and putting them down just as fast as you can. But still, it doesn't seem to be enough. So you're just kind of rolling along. You, you feel like you're being dragged through life. It's frightening. It's painful. I know, I've been there. But I want to encourage you this morning. Because God never wastes a heartache. God never wastes a painful experience. When we're hurting, God isn't absent. He's at work. Romans 8.28 says this. 
And we know that in, in what? In all things, not just the good things, in all things, even the bad things, God does what? Works for the good of those who love him, who've been called according to whose purpose? His purpose. According to his plan for our life. The great missionary Hudson Taylor once said, it does not matter how great the pressure is. What really matters is where the pressure lies. Whether it comes between you and God or whether it presses you nearer his heart. So if you're letting the pains and the pressures of life come between you and God, then it's time to grow up and allow your struggles to instead draw you closer to God. Pour your heart out to him in prayer. Open up his word and listen to him. Seek his plan for your life and get on board with wherever he's leading you. And then trust him and wait on him to direct you, to show you, and to ultimately bless you. Joseph waited years and God came through for him in a huge, huge way. God's always come through for me. And he'll come through for you as well, I promise. Just continue to seek God's plan and determine to grow through life's pain. And if you'll do that, then you will eventually emerge from whatever darkness you're going through with a new strength and a sense of victory that you never had before. Because now you see that God really is working in your life. And he's working through your life to help change our world. Did you know that Elvis Presley started out his musical life in an Assemblies of God church that preached Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior? And yet Elvis himself searched all of his brief 42 years of life for something else. And he never found it. He had a Bible that he apparently read, but he read other books on spirituality as well. Books that had nothing to do with Christ or Christianity. Apparently, Elvis never found spiritual joy or satisfaction in his church background. Something was obviously lacking, so he kept on searching. Now, I can only speculate, but I've got a hunch that the reason Elvis didn't find what he was looking for in the Christian faith might have been because, like so many others, he didn't seek first the kingdom of God. Maybe he had his life all mapped out and maybe he tried to fit Jesus into a corner or a nook or a cranny of the life he had planned out. But he wasn't all in. And that just doesn't satisfy. If we don't go all in in our walk with Jesus, we won't be satisfied. It doesn't satisfy us. It doesn't satisfy God. And we end up, we just keep looking in other places, searching and searching to find what we can only have when we grow up enough to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and to go all in on God's plan for our life. So ask yourself, where does God fit into your life this morning? If he is number one, if you're all in to trust and follow him, even through the painful and trying experiences, then good for you. Keep it up. Keep learning. Keep growing. Keep letting God use you to change our world. But if God's not first in your life, then I challenge you to grow up this morning, to put him in his rightful place in your heart. And that's on the throne, in charge, top priority. No other arrangement is going to work for you. So if you're a Christian who has let your plans kind of knock Christ off the throne of your heart, what's it going to take for you to grow up? Put him back on that throne. Seek first his kingdom, his righteousness. What's it going to take? I pray it only takes this message from God's word this morning and not a bunch of hardship like Joseph had to go through before he would grow up. I pray that you can hear this message and recognize that it's describing you. That you're the one who needs to make those changes and that you'll do that this morning. And if you've never surrendered your life to Jesus as Savior and Lord, then I encourage you to recognize that this morning. 
and to say, I need to start following Jesus. And if you do have a life change you need to make this morning, whether it's to, to repent and, and recommit your life to Christ as an already immersed believer, or whether it's someone who's coming to the Lord for the first time, I encourage you to come over to the Next Steps prayer room. One of our elders, John, will be over here, and he'll be happy to talk with you. Or if there's anything else going on in your life right now, and you just want somebody to pray with you, head over to the Next Steps prayer room. And they'll be happy to take care of you. There, let's stand up right now. And uh, let me lead us in a word of prayer. And you can head over to the Next Steps prayer room as I pray. Father, it is sometimes hard for us to have the faith to believe that our life can really count for something in this world. That, that little us can really make a difference in our world that can, make a, that can matter for eternity. And yet your word tells us that's exactly why we're here. Lord, the reason you give each of us our next breath is because you're not done using us to change this world for your glory. So Father, help us put our own plans aside. Help us, Lord, to let go of our selfish desires and just say, Lord, what's your plan for my life? Why am I really here? How can you use me to change our world? And even though it might be something that doesn't impress others, Lord, if we'll just be faithful to your plan, we know that we will be eternally blessed. So, Father, help us. Have that self-examination. Seek your plan for our life. And then grow up enough to follow your plan. And we look forward to seeing the fruit it bears for your kingdom. As one heart, one person at a time, we can touch hearts and souls for Jesus. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. Right now we're going to prepare for a time of communion. Good morning. For those of you that may not have been here before, uh, we have communion cups available back on the table back here. If you did not get one, please raise your hand and one of our deacons or elders will bring you a communion cup if you need one. Uh, I don't see any hands, but if you do, feel free to let us know. Um, I'm going to use the word anticipation this morning in my communion meditation. I've had a few different situations recently that um, I guess anticipation is a real good word for. We went to a birthday party down at my son's house down in Indianapolis a week ago. And um, my seven-year-old grandson comes up to him and he goes, Grandpa, he says, you know what I want for my birthday? And I said, what do you want, Griffin? He says, I want to go to your lake, quote, and go fishing with you all day long. <laughs> it's kind of a neat, you know, neat little thing. I guess he thinks because I own property in Liberty, I own, part of, I own Brookville Reservoir, I don't know. But, <laughs> but anyway, he, he was anticipating that. We haven't gotten that done yet, but we're going to. So then the next thing that happened was, I went up to, I was in Minnesota this week on business, and I had to go to Duluth. I was up there for some meetings, and my other son lives in Minneapolis, and I came to his house, and I spent Thursday with them, and we, we did some pool time, and they were actually celebrating my birthday. And my, when I got there, um, it, it was later on the day, it was probably, I don't know, five, six o'clock, my three-year-old grandson comes up to me and hugs me as much as they can, you know, hugging around your legs. He goes, Grandpa, I've been waiting on you all day long. <laughs> so it makes a grandpa feel good, you know. And then we get to the service this morning and we're singing the song, uh, Open Up the Heavens. There's anticipation in that song, okay. We've waited for this day. We're gathered in your name, calling out to you. Your glory like a fire, awakening desire, will burn our hearts with truth. You know, I grew up in a church, a, um, a, a church, well, in Michigan and then another of the same denomination here in town. And we did communion once a month maybe okay it was something that they had to fit into their program and if it didn't fit okay we'll get it next month i got to tell you it's a blessing to be able to do communion every week here at ucc um, and, I, and i have to ask you the question is this is communion something that you anticipate i'm gonna use that word again or is it something that stands between you and lunch okay uh, this is an awesome time every week that we can use for a time of spiritual cleansing and and growth and cultivating our relationship with christ the way I think about communion, or at least one of the ways I think about communion, uh, Psalms 42.1 says, As the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, O God. Okay? I'm going to ask Mike to play a little clip of a song. As the deer pants for the water, so my soul longeth
God's good money. So my question is, when we're having our time of communion, are we doing it with anticipation? Are we like that deer panting for water is a time that we can use to grow closer to our God? So let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for this time and this service. We thank you for the anticipation that can come with it. We pray that we would truly have that anticipation, that we would long for this time in our service. Thank you for your love and forgiveness. We pray now that we would grow closer to you through this time. We ask in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you for worshiping with us today. Uh, if you're visiting with us, a special welcome to you. So glad that you chose to worship with us. I hope and pray that you've been blessed by your time of worship here this morning. You'll come back and uh, see us again. Let us get to know you a little bit. We'd love to be able to do that. If you haven't filled out a connection card already, you'll find them in the seat back in front of you. We'd appreciate you filling out one of those. Just your name and email address would be great. That way we can get in touch with you and just uh, let you know how much we appreciate you being with us this morning. Uh, before I let you go, a, a couple of announcements. Uh, just uh, let you know, these are all in your worship bulletin, but I want to highlight just a couple. Vacation Bible School is uh, going to be July 9th through the 13th. That's coming right up. July's right around the corner here, folks. So uh, be prepared for that. Mark those dates off. If you're able to help, I'm sure Michael could use more volunteers. But get your kids, your neighbor's kids, your, your brother and sister's kids, get them all here for a great Vacation Bible School. And the other thing, I guess this is not in the bulletin, uh, we have an ad in the bulletin that we're seeking a facilities manager here at UCC. That position has been filled. Our own David Strawn is going to be our facilities manager, so welcome on board, David. And once again, thanks to Tina um, for her service, and she even hung on a little longer than she intended to and continued to fill the position until we could fill it. So Tina, thank you so much for that as well. And one last thing, Terry... Isn't it your anniversary as well? Yeah, well, I didn't see you raise your hand earlier. How many years? 55? Oh, well, that's close enough. Come on up. 55 years deserves a couple of Rice Krispie treats. Happy anniversary, brother. <laughs> oh. Let's uh, stand, and I'll dismiss this with a word of prayer. <clears throat> Father, we thank you so much for your love and your grace and the opportunity we've had to be together in worship this morning. Father, help us to take the message to heart today, to live it out in our lives so that uh, we can learn those lessons and grow without having to have the, the painful experiences that, that you would have to bring upon us to bring that growth about. And Lord, may your kingdom be changed, may your world be changed more to the image of your kingdom as a result. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Have a great week. Was it?